unfortunately starling <laughs> yeah, tank a lot of the cavities. But also um, tree swallows, violet green swallows, nuthatches, chickadees, there's maybe 50 birds that, that are cavity nesters just, just in Oregon. So, um, so the, and, and any bird that'll nest in a birdhouse is a, like a natural cavity nester. So. Yeah, so we're getting into, um, like here's oak right along the edge where it's drier. And then when you get further in, those are all ash. See that witchity, witchity, witchity. And um, there's actually a way you can tell even after all the leaves fall <coughs> because the ash trees will have opposite branching where the branches and the twigs come off opposite. The oaks, it'll be alternate. And, and so there's only certain trees that have the opposite branching and you can actually see it in the wintertime. The mad trees, maple, ash, and dogwood. Um, there's, there's a couple other ones, but, um, but those are the main ones that you'll hear. So you can sort of see the opposite branching up, up on some of these, and when the leaves are gone, you can easily see it. So, so the ash can actually take wet feet during the winter. They can, they can actually um, take some standing water, um, whereas the oaks really don't like it. The oaks like it where it's much drier. So, um, also back behind, you can see, even though it's flapping now, that's not a red tail hawk, and you can see the difference. See the way it, it's flying really stiff and kind of uh, tipping. I, I, it's a, I call it a tippy vulture because it kind of tips back and forth. It gets a little unstable one way, a little unstable another way. It's just taken off in the morning. It's a little cool for it yet, so that's why it's, um, it's flapping now. But see the little bit of a V for vulture there? So that's how you can tell your basic red tail from your basic... Um, turkey vulture, and those are the two most common raptors that, that um, we'll see around here. Although turkey vultures will mostly be gone in the winter. Like I said, they go all the way down to South America. Some of them stay, though, is that right? Or? A few of them, yeah. If they can make a living, they, they fly south, one, because they aren't really good flyers. And so when the air gets colder and denser, it's hard to get lift. So it's much easier if, they, if, if they're down in South America to fly. Um, some, some of them don't go all the way down. Um, and, and the other thing is, since they eat dead stuff, carcasses and whatnot, if it's really cold, they're frozen. And so they, they really don't have access to food. So there's a couple of reasons that they I might see. Yeah, that makes sense. And there's some other things. There's, and you'll, we should hear some and see some. There's a lot of finches around now. Goldfinches, there's lesser goldfinch, and the, the American goldfinch, and house finches. So, they're warbly, and they actually nest kind of later. They're, they're probably nesting now or maybe just finishing up nesting. They're one of the later nesting birds, the goldfinches. So, um, and, and they're real talkative, too. You can, you can, yeah, they have a real kind of pretty warbly song. Can you still afford the turvy view of this one? Like no, this, this is, is a, um, I don't know specifically this one. It, it, it looks like it might be a Sonchus. These are non-native dandelion-like things. This one is actually Hypocorus. This one right here. It's the one you get in your lawn that like flattens yeah. things out. It's not a dandelion. Um, specifically, it's called a false dandelion or a cat's ear because it's, it's kind of uh, fuzzy. Um, but here again, you know, look, there's a native bee here. I'm, I'm really, you know, it, this time of the year, most of our native plants, except for the gum weed, are, um, are, are done flowering. And so, you know, a lot of the, you know, the so-called invasive or non-native weeds um, provide a lot of nectar for um, uh, um, you know, different native bees and beetles and butterflies and things. So, so, so that's what the season, uh, we, yeah, we, yeah, in the Willamette Valley, yeah. Yeah, by, particularly by August, you know, there, there's almost nothing that's, that's flowering anymore. And so it's just the, the imported European weeds that are, <laughs> that are uh, uh, providing the nectar for stuff. So. Is the tarweed uh, invasive also? No, the, the tarweed is, is um, it needs disturbance though. Because where you find it, if you hike the, the San Chifan Trail, it's just right along the trail. It's not out in the, the nice, pretty, restored wetlands. It's right, you know, where people have tromped down right along the trail. So here again, you know, when we talk about native, the Willamette Valley, 
has had people here for at least 10,000, probably 15,000 years that have managed the land pretty, pretty actively. Um, you know, they, they've burned regularly. Um, and so is that, a, you know, a natural area? Um, you know, it depends if you consider humans natural or not, or, or how you <laughs> use that, that much misused term natural. Um, so, so yeah, it's, um, you know, and when you restore, it's restored to what? Restore to pre-European, restore to pre-Native American, restore to pre-Ice Age. Um, you know, so, so but, but what the, the, the idea of the wetlands, the 3,000 acres that are part of the West Indian wetlands, is that um, to, to, to th there isn't much of this particular habitat left, native prairie. Um, out of maybe a million acres, um, you know, 170 years ago, there might be, you know, 1% of that left. And, and so that's why the West Eugene wetlands are really important, to protect that particular habitat. The, um, the, the upland habitat <coughs> was originally maybe two-thirds, and this would be considered upland. And then the, the, wet, um, the wet prairie um, habitat also, so that's important. And if you want to watch a, an exercise in frustration, watch Laura try and catch a dragon. <laughs> They're fast. They're really fast. Yeah, remember what I was telling you about, you know, forget it, trying to, trying to catch something, you know, between now and probably 5 o'clock. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we might, we might be able to sneak up on some of the ponds there, but, um, but yeah, it, it's, it, it's, it's better if you just look at them with binoculars or have a, a lens you can take photos of them from a distance. To, to actually catch them, you have to be either really good or, or um, lucky. <laughs> well, I was going to say lucky. <laughs>
has really nice little um, little wet woodland in here that, that gets standing water in the wintertime. Um, you can see it's almost all ash trees here. Again, there's a couple of oaks on the edge here. Um, this is an ash right behind us. Um, and, and you can see, yeah, something happens to these. I'm not really sure what. But this is actually one leaf. These are called compound leaves. Um, we, we can let these guys go by, too. Yeah, we can let them go. We're going to be slow and talking a lot. So. You playing through? Anyway, this is actually one leaf. It just attaches to one leaf bud, and so it's called a compound leaf, and a number of trees have those. It's really distinctive about ash. Um, walnut has that. Um, Ilanthus, there's a number of things that have compound leaves. So that's, that's distinctive about this. The other thing that's cool about ash is if you like baseball, um, about half of the baseball bats, used to be most of the baseball bats, are made out of eastern ash, eastern white ash. It's gotten from um, Pennsylvania and New York. My brother lives in Louisville, Kentucky, and that's the Louisville Sluggers, or, or mostly that, until Barry Bonds um, started using a maple bat. So now there's actually about half the bats are sugar maple. Um, but, but it has really light, strong wood. I think Babe Ruth used to use a hickory bat. But then he was a big, strong guy, and but hickory doesn't really have the, the give or the elasticity, just like oak. If you use an oak bat, it'll probably just shatter. You know, whereas these have enough, you know, kind of give that, that you can really hit a ball pretty pretty good. So, so um, yeah, ash trees are, are kind of interesting. Um, good news and bad news on ash. They, if, if you're an ecologist, they can take over an area. Um, that's why you regularly have to burn or mow um, when you have ash. If, you, if you've seen in South Eugene, the running trail there around the Amazon, that's all ash. That's what most of the wetlands would look like if you didn't mow or burn. And the California burned for, um, uh, for camas or some of the other things that they, that they would harp, so to keep it open. Um, so the downside to that is there's this thing called the Emerald Ash Borer. It, it started in Michigan, it's, it's gone through Ohio, and just devastated every single ash tree. And it's only a matter of time before it's, it's out here. So if you can imagine every tree in here being dead, which it will probably, unless they can figure something out, be. You can actually treat trees um, very expensively to save one, you know, one or two trees, but it's just not worth it on a, on an, um, a, a, a large scale. So yeah, they, they actually have traps I've seen up for emerald ash borers to see if they're here yet. They're not, but like I say, it's just a matter of time. They're, you know, you can kind of see them spreading out from Michigan through the Midwest <coughs> and whatnot. Do you have them in where you're from? Oh yeah, well, they're no longer in Illinois, but um, uh -huh. we lived in around two times. Yeah. It took about an hour. Oh, okay. So give you an idea. Okay. <laughs> time-wise. <laughs> <laughs> keep track of time. <laughs> Yeah, you could be here for a whole week telling this stuff. Exactly. <laughs>
apparent. Why they're orange? Because if you pull these up, and this is the, the wild ancestor, they're they're not. They're white. They're purple. If you buy, you know, some of the um, what do they call those? Not ancestral, but uh, heritage heritage heirloom um, carrots. Yeah, they're they're not orange. Darners do that. Um, there's another one which is meadow hawk that, that'll that'll sit up on a perch and go out after something. Okay. Um, Maybe that's what you have. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the the darners are called that because they fly around all the time, like the one you're trying to catch, the green yeah. darner, and and you try and catch them, and you go darn, darn. <laughs> so that's, that's how the darners got their name. Yeah. So. My guess is these are bush kids. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they're, they're you know in flocks of 10 and 20 now. They've hatched out. They nest really early in those little hanging nests. Yeah. It looks like hanging socks mm -hmm. made from spider webs. So spiders are very important. You know, all the bush tit nests, all the hummingbird nests, spider web. Really strong, really elastic. As the babies get bigger, they can stretch. And then they put lichen on the outside to kind of camouflage it. So. Um, so those are all the spiders, uh, yeah, they'll go collect them because here again, spiders that they start building their nets, nests about March, and those might be old spider webs. You know, the spiders may be defunct. A, a lot of them don't survive the winter. Some do, depending on how, how severe the winter is. So, um, so yeah, there's there's plenty of spiders and plenty of spider webs around. As you're beginning to notice now, <laughs> as you're running into more and more webs, particularly Arrhenius diadematus, this crop spider. Those are everywhere around people's houses. It's a cosmopolitan species that um, is one of the most common ones. That takes us off in a whole different direction. Mm -hmm. You know, we like to live in houses. We like our you know, comfortable things. So we, um, we we kind of need both at this point. trying to catch that uh, trap there. Where is it? Is that the green trap? Oh, yeah. You know, I'm not really sure, but you'll, you'll find those traps around. Um, some of them for, are for gypsy moths. Um, yeah, like I said, the, the, um, the ash borer traps look a little bit different, but um, yeah, I'm not specifically sure on that. I, I would guess. Gypsy moth, which they found here and sprayed a couple of times. Yeah, if, if you if you remember that back in the 80s, they oh, yeah. they oh, sprayed over here. Right. Here again, a mixed blessing. If gypsy moths get in here um, and get established, they could really devastate the forest. Um, 
But the problem is when you spray, even though it's, it's BT, you know, supposedly a, a, a natural, um, uh, you know, thing that they, that they use, it, it's not really specific. So it doesn't just kill gypsy moths, which are in the order Lepidoptera moths, it kills butterflies too. It kills the caterpillars of both. Because it's the caterpillars that, that devastate the trees, the Douglas firs and things like that. So, so it's a, you know, it's rather a blunt instrument, but um, yeah, it's, it's kind of one of those things. California darner and a blue-eyed darner, and you really have to catch them to figure out which one's which. But <laughs> yeah, let's watch. This is this could be entertainment right in itself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to embarrass myself by trying to catch it. <laughs> habitat for starlings. If you want to create good starling habitat, put up one of these metal buildings. 